organic chemistry. Now, organic chemistry is a branch of chemistry, a branch of chemistry that studies a branch of chemistry that studies compounds of carbons. We study compounds of the element carbon. But in this study, we exclude the oxides of carbon. The oxides of carbon are two, carbon two oxide, carbon four oxide, those are the two oxides of carbon that we, don't, we do not study in organic chemistry. We also exclude the salts of carbonic acid, and that is hydrogen carbonates and carbonates. So you remember these things that we don't study in organic chemistry are looked at in carbon and some of its compounds at form 2. So that is why we don't look at them again. Now, you will notice that apart from carbon, we do have other elements, other elements that are found in organic compounds. These elements include, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen, we have nitrogen, we have sulfur, and we do have chlorine as well. So apart from carbon, these are also some of the elements that we do find in organic compounds. Now. I want us to take note that organic compounds are so many. In fact, 90% of all compounds on earth are organic. So the next question that we are asking ourselves is, why is carbon able to form so many compounds? So, at this point, let us look at the unique properties of carbon. Why does it form so many compounds? And the unique properties of carbon are three in number. The first one is that carbon, as we all know, has a valency four, which means it has four valence electrons. So carbon, is able to use all its four valence electrons. Now, how does it use the four valence electrons? It uses the four valent valence electrons to link with itself and with other elements. So this is one of the properties that make carbon to really form so many compounds on earth. The second property which is unique to carbon is carbon is able to form single, double, and triple bonds with itself. This is very unique. It is only carbon that is able to do that. And the very last unique property of carbon is that it can link to itself to form long continuous chains. This property is known in chemistry as catenation. It is only carbon that has this property. So, the way our syllabus is arranged in 844 is that we have organic one, which is being studied at form three. And then we have organic two, which is being studied at form four. 
So in organic one, we do study compounds of carbon that also contain only hydrogen. We commonly refer to them as hydrocarbons. That is what we learn in organic chemistry one. When we come to organic chemistry two in form four, then we shall look at those other compounds that contain carbon and these other elements which are mentioned here. That is oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and chlorine. So allow me now to introduce organic chemistry one. Organic chemistry one. So here we study strictly only hydrocarbons. We study strictly hydrocarbons. And as I've said earlier, hydrocarbons are organic compounds that contain, these are organic compounds that contain only carbon and hydrogen. Now, we remember that these hydrocarbons can further be divided. They can further be divided into three groups, which we commonly call homologous series. So under this, we do have alkenes. We have alkenes and we have alkynes. So, this video we want to dedicate to the first homologous series, which is alkenes. So, we want to welcome you to this video where we want to talk about alkenes. Before we begin, let's start by saying that Alkenes are saturated hydrocarbons. So what do we mean by saturated hydrocarbons? These are compounds made of carbon and hydrogen only. And where carbon to carbon bonds are single covalent bonds. So when we say alkenes are saturated compounds, we mean that in the structures of alkenes, the carbon to carbon bonds are single covalent bonds. So, under alkenes, what a candidate is expected to know is occurrence. Where do we get these alkenes in nature? We also expect you to know how to name the alkenes. We also expect you to know what isomers of alkenes are. So there's something called isomerism in alkenes. Do you know how to draw the isomers? Do you know how to name the isomers? Then we have lab preparation of the same. And finally, the most important is the reactions of the alkenes. To a lesser extent, you may also want to know a few uses. So as far as this video is concerned, occurrence we shall leave to you to do on your own, same to naming, same to isomerism and uses. We want to dedicate this video to the two, which is lab preparation of alkenes and the reactions of alkenes. Allow me to move straight to the lab preparation of alkenes. So we are talking about lab 
preparation of alkanes. So one thing that our candidates should know is that alkanes are prepared by what? They are prepared by heating a mixture. This mixture is normally made of soda lime, something we call soda lime, and we have a salt of sodium that is generally called generally called sodium alkanoate. So we have those, these two mixtures. Remember, this is a general name. When we come to the actual alkane, you have to now give us the particular name of the sodium alkanoate salt. Now, how do you remember the sodium alkanoate salt? There is a fact here that uh, students of chemistry should also know that the sodium alkanoate, the sodium alkanoate used should have one carbon atom, should have one carbon atom more than the alkane being prepared. This is what is going to guide us as we give the particular name of our sodium salt. So I want to give a few examples here in a table. So on the left, I want to prepare around three alkanes. So let's talk about alkane being prepared. And on the right, let's see the sodium salt that you are supposed to use. This sodium salt is generally called sodium alkanoate. So if I want to prepare methane, and we all know meth, means one carbon. The sodium salt, according to our guide, should have now two carbons. So the name becomes sodium ethanoate. Eth here means two. Meth means one. So as we have stated here, the sodium salt used should have one carbon atom more. So here one should have two. Suppose now I need to prepare ethane. Ethane now has two carbons. I'll go for sodium propanoate. Prop means three. So three carbons here, you get an alkane with two carbons. Let's end because now I believe you've known the pattern. Propane has three carbons. The sodium salt I'll use will be called sodium butanoate. Butanoate or but means it has four carbons when you need an alkane with three carbons. I hope we are clear on that point. Let us also talk about the soda lime, which is present in the mixture. So what is soda lime? Soda lime is simply a mixture of, again, two things. We have sodium hydroxide and the next thing that is there in soda lime is called calcium oxide. So, what happens is that it is the sodium hydroxide, allow me to use symbols here, it is the sodium hydroxide that takes part in the reaction. But why do we mix it with calcium oxide then? So, the reason is calcium oxide is mixed with the, the sodium carbonate, uh, with the sodium hydroxide, sorry, because the sodium hydroxide is the liquescent, which means it is able to absorb some moisture from the atmosphere. And because we need our solid to be completely dry as we heat, if it's able to absorb this moisture from the atmosphere, it might interfere with our reaction. Now, once you obtain your alkane, we, obs we will collect uh, the gaseous ones by the normal overwater method of gas collection. So, with that, 
Let's have a look at a few examples in terms of equation writing. So suppose I want to prepare methane. Methane is an alkane with one carbon. So we've agreed from the soda lime we shall get sodium hydroxide as our reactant and then the sodium salt will be that that has two carbons. So this is called sodium ethanoate. We will heat that mixture. We end up getting methane, which is a gas, and you get another product that is sodium carbonate. Now, this equation balances out by itself. And again, I want to state here, because it is organic equation, we do not need these state symbols. But if you have to put it, then the state symbols must be correct. So the advice we have for this topic, please, if you do not know the correct state symbols, please avoid them. So let me go to the next member, which is ethane. Soda lime still gives me sodium hydroxide, but this time round I'll use sodium propanoate, which has three carbons. So that is how we write sodium propanoate. One, two, three. Then I'll be able to get my ethane, CH3CH3, or you can simply condense it as C2H6, and you get your sodium carbonate as well. Again, this equation doesn't need balancing because it balances out. Students, I believe up to that point, we are now comfortable with lab preparation of alkenes. So, before we end the video, let us quickly move to the reactions. And one thing that we need to know is that alkanes are generally unreactive. Now, this is owed to what we call saturation. We have explained that alkanes are saturated, and for that matter, they are not very reactive. However, they undergo three reactions only. They undergo three reactions. So join me as we discuss them. Number one, I want to talk about burning. So, burning. Burning, we have two situations. One, if there is enough supply of oxygen if there is enough supply of air, which means you are burning your alkanes in a well-ventilated room. Then, I'll use the first member to explain. Then, your alkane would burn, actually, uh, this one we are burning will burn with a blue flame, and you will get full oxidation of carbon to carbon dioxide and oxidation of hydrogen to water or steam and of course we balance with a two on oxygen and a two on hydrogen but this is only possible if the combustion is taking place in sufficient supply of air suppose I have limited supply if there is limited supply there will be incomplete combustion of my alkane and for that matter I will be able to get either carbon 2 oxide and steam, which will balance with a 2 on a methane, a 2 on carbon 2 oxide, and a 4 on water, and of course a 3 on oxygen. Or you may also be able to get soot. Soot is what we normally see in the luminous flame of a Bunsen burner. So soot is actually a form of carbon. So if the supply of oxygen is not enough, then the second equation will take place. So my dear students, that is all you need to remember about combustion of alkanes. And I'm using the first member methane to, to do those equations. Do not forget that if you are not sure of the states, you can leave them as I have done, because our syllabus doesn't demand 
state symbols when your equation is organic in nature. Good enough for the first reaction of alkanes. Let's move to the second reaction. And this one is called cracking. Cracking means that we are breaking long chain alkanes to shorter chain alkanes. The reason as to why this cracking is being done is long chain al alkanes are not very useful. Alkanes with so many carbons in a chain are not very, very useful. Examples include bitumen that we use to make roads. How many times do we build roads in a year? Your guess is as good as mine. So, when the chain gets shorter for the alkane, the more useful it becomes. So, we are able to break down a long chain alkane into a shorter chain alkane using what we call cracking. And there are two ways we can do it. The first cracking is done by heat, and therefore we call it thermal cracking, where we are supposed to heat our alkane to about 700 degrees Celsius. The second cracking that we can do is called catalytic or catalytic. This one is done when the alkane is heated to about 450 degrees Celsius, but in presence of aluminum oxide catalyst. Aluminum oxide is also called alumina. Alumina. Or you can also use a uh, silicon, silica, sorry, silica, or this is obviously our silicon four oxide. So those are the two catalysts that we use when we are catalytically uh, cracking alkanes. Now, you may be wondering, what do we form when you crack a long chain alkane? Very simple. When you crack a long chain alkane, you get a shorter chain alkane and an alkene. That is the general rule of cracking. So, I will give an example. Suppose we have an alkane with six carbons. This is called hexane. When I crack it, I can get, this is an alkene known as ethene, and I'll get a shorter chain alkane that is now butane. Now, as long as the carbons on the left balance with those ones on the right, you can form any alkene and any alkyne as, as much as the carbons will balance. So another option we have here could be that uh, the C6H14 can be cracked to give C2H4 plus C3H6 plus CH4. So you can see this one is an alkene, this another alkene and an alkane. That is a possibility. Another possibility is this. We can get two moles of our alkene and an alkane. So for students, I think here, what you need to know is as long as your carbons are going to balance on the left and on the right, then we are good to go. So for C6H14, these three are possible products of cracking. Let's finally end with the third reaction of alkanes, and these ones are what we call substitution reactions. So what do we mean here? Substitution reactions is that of the four hydrogens or the hydrogens that are present in alkanes, we can progressively replace them. We can progressively uh, substitute them with halogen atoms when we carry out these reactions in the presence of uh, sunlight. So what we want to say here is that alkanes react with 
allow me to use symbols fluorine chlorine and bromine of course iodine we leave out because it is not very reactive so this one takes place in presence of sunlight and we are giving a series give a series a series of products depending on the amount of the alkane used and the amount of halogen supplied so to give a series of products depending on depending on the amount of halogen supplied the amount of halogen supplied now at this point why must these reactions be carried out in presence of sunlight what does sunlight do so we know sunlight has what we call ultraviolet rays so the ultraviolet rays in sunlight they provide energy they provide energy that is used to split to, to split the halogen molecule into more reactive free atoms. So then once these free atoms are obtained, they are able to attack your alkane molecule and therefore the reaction will proceed. So we want to take an example with our first member and we are reacting with chlorine. So, for this reaction, the first hydrogen would be removed or would be substituted by chlorine. So there were four, we now have three, and a chloride atom gets in. And then plus what? Of course, hydrogen chloride. So, the reaction would stop here if we are given one mole of chlorine. If we only have one mole of chlorine, this would be the end of our reaction. But if you supply more, then you are able to get other products. Of course, this one is called chloromethane. The name of our product here is called chloromethane. So if you have more supply of chlorine, then your chloromethane would continue reacting. We shall replace the second hydrogen from here. So we shall have CH2Cl and of course hydrogen chloride. This second reaction is only able to take place if you have excess supply of chlorine. Then if you do supply more, your, your dichloromethane would react further and we are able to replace the next hydrogen so we shall have CHCl3 and of course HCl. This is called trichloromethane. And the last product which takes place if you continue supplying more chlorine would be the all the four hydrogens are replaced by chlorine. And this one would be called tetrachloromethane. We will be Going to past KCSC papers later on when we are through with these tutorials on the three homologous series that are studied in Organic Chemistry 1. Thank you for watching. Join us for the next video where we shall talk about alkenes and alkynes combined.